easy event, and the topic is the Network Packets Diary, a Carol Journey. Hello. So I will explain or try to explain what happens when you have a, just a normal computer, you have a network card in the computer, and you receive a packet, data packet from the network, and what happens next. And of course, the packet goes through various things up to your application, and then there's a reply. It goes all the way back to the wire, so we'll cover both of those paths. Um, but first, we need to say what is the packet. So you have packet which consists of several parts. It's data, and before data, there are several headers. Does not have to be three headers, as in this example. But let's take, for the sake of simplicity, let's take the simplest case, and that's a packet, the TCP packet. So we have Ethernet header, IP header, and TCP header. What's in the headers? One important thing is checksums. Those are those mathematical things that allows us to detect whether the packet is correct or has been corrupted on its way through network. In this example, we've got three checksums in IP header, in TCP header, and at the end of the frame that belongs to the Ethernet header. Those are not equal, but whatever. Whoever wants to know more, look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, First, Ethernet header, it has certain fields, destination, MAC address, source MAC address, and type. This header is sometimes also called L2 header, so layer two. Uh, layer one, that's like physical thing that we don't care about, that's what on the wire, and this is not interesting for us. So this is L2 header. IP header, or L3 header, has many fields, out of those, only certain will be of interest to us. Again, I'm simplifying stuff. We will not cover everything. We don't have enough time for that. So the important thing is, oh, OK, so maybe back to the Ethernet header, the last field is type, which denotes what is the type of the next header. So this will be IP, uh, the number for the IP uh, type. Uh, in IP header, we also have some source and destination address. We have the checksum. And we have the IP type, which is the type of the next header. In, the, in our case, that would be TCP. Uh, <coughs> TCP header, again, source, destination. In this case, uh, in this, uh, case it's not uh, an address, but a port. You probably know what the port is. And checksum. And there is data. So let's look what happens when the packet uh, arrives to the hardware. This is called ingress. So ingress is the path that's from the network to, uh, to the CPU, to our application. The network interface controller, that's the, the card that you have in your machine, receives the packet over the wire or air, whatever. And first thing it does is it, it, it compares the destination address against some internal uh, filter or some internal list of addresses that it is willing to accept. This can be programmed. So um, usually what happens is that the operating system programs uh, to by the way, by way of the driver, it programs the addresses, the MAC addresses that it is willing to accept. The reason for this is performance. We want to drop packets that we don't care about as soon as possible. Uh, by the way, you can also bypass the MAC address filter by setting the card in promis promiscuous uh, mode. You can do that by software. We won't cover that here. Next thing the hardware does is it verifies the Ethernet checksum. If it's incorrect, it just drops the packet. If it's correct, it continues. 
By the way, the, the, the FCS frame check um, frame check sequence, I think, is not reported usually to the operating system. So it's like just discarded by, by the NIC. Next thing the, the NIC does, it stores the packet to the system memory using DMA. To where? To a buffer that was before previously programmed by the driver. So driver allocates some memory for several packets and just tells the NIC where the buffers are. And the NIC uses these buffers to store incoming packets. Once this is done, the NIC triggers an interrupt, which means it lets CPU know, oh, look, I have data ready. Uh, now, the CPU interrupts everything it is doing and starts handling this, this event. This is important. It really, the, whatever is currently going on is, gone, is interrupted and uh, the code that uh, is usually, or that is part of the driver for the NIC that handles interrupt is executed. We don't want to do much work in this mode because we can be blocking some uh, processing, some code that is doing something important and time critical. So we do only what is really, really needed. We tell the card, okay, yeah, we know, shut up. And we schedule a processing for later. This is called bottom half. So what I'm talking about now, this is called, also called top half. That's the uh, handling of the hardware interrupt. And in top half, we schedule the bottom half. Now, sometimes later, when the operating system sees fit, or in this case, Linux, and we're speaking really specifically about Linux, although much of what I'm talking about uh, is used in other operating systems as well, but has different names and so on. So, <coughs> next thing, also, when, when, the, when, Linux, when the Linux kernel sees fit, it starts the bottom half routine, which task is to really fetch the, the, the packet and so on. So first thing, it identifies the memory where the packet is located, which of the buffers contains the data from the car. Uh, basically, it does that by reading another memory the, the NIC just tells the driver where, what was the buffer uh, that contains uh, the, the packet. Once this is identified, the driver allocates an escape buff. Um, okay. Let's, say, let's interrupt this for a while, and we need to explain what escape buff is. Escape buff. It's short cut for socket buffer. So it's some kind of structure in memory that contains metadata that belongs to a packet. So packet contains data, like Ethernet header, IP header, blah, 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 data. And we need to have some information about that that's carried along the packet all the way through the kernel. The structure is called struct escape buff. Uh, in short, it's also called SKB. I will use both, uh, both names uh, here. Uh, it contains a lot of fields. So this is only a subset that I'm showing on this slide. Uh, for example, let's interface. That will later become a pointer to the network interface that received the, the packet. Or on the opposite way, on the way out, uh, it will contain the address of or the, the pointer to network interface that will be used to send the packet out. Then there's protocol. Protocol is really duplicated here. It's contained in the data as well, but we want to have the, the metadata for, to, for, for, uh, to be efficient. Next, there are four pointers. You see the arrows on the slide from head and end. So what's head and end? Those are pointer to the beginning and end of the allocated buffer. So this 
is the buffer that we have available for the packet. It's usually larger than the packet. Well, there's a room at the end that's quite obvious, because when we program the buffers to the, to the card, to the NIC, we don't know how long the packet we receive will be. So we have to like, accommodate for the, for the longest uh, possible buffer, kind of. Uh, I'm not entirely correct in everything. Please excuse me if you know if you know how this really works. Uh, you may notice that. So this was one of the cases. By our understanding, this is enough. So that's how come how comes there's an empty space at the end. There is also empty space at the beginning for various reasons. Let's not go into detail. Let's just say that it can be. So half and end is the real size of the allocated memory. Now, the two other pointers, data and tail, points to where the actual valid data begins and ends. So this is clear. The nice thing about this is that we can be very efficient in removing and adding headers. So let's see what happens when we need to strip the Ethernet header. We do just this. We move one pointer, nothing more. No data changes, nothing. When we want to add it back, we just move the pointer back. <laughs> the data is still there. It's no problem. So we can remove more headers like that. Uh, there is one, one problem, of course. Let's imagine the situation that we want, that we have like all headers added, and we want to add one more. And we don't have enough space at the beginning. Now we cannot just move the pointer. We have to do more work. We have to allocate a new memory, uh, copy the packet to a new memory, of course shift it a bit so we have uh, space at the beginning. We change the head and end pointers. We change the data and tail pointers. And then we can free the old one, the old memory. So this is expensive operation. But we can do that. It's no problem. We can do that because the packet is identified by SKBuff. So whenever we want to read any data, we have to go through the SKBuff to find where they are. Another thing this allows is cloning. We can just like that make two packets out of one with the same contents. Just allocate a new escape buff and copy it, and we're done. What's, what's interesting is they, have, they can have different view of what the packet looks like, because the data and tape pointers are, can be different. So the escape buff on the right starts with the TCP header. It, the, the packet does not have any Ethernet and IP header. And it still works. Of course, we need to be careful in the kernel, because when this happens, we cannot modify the data in one SK buff, because any modification in the data in the packet itself, like here, in the header, or this header, would be visible in both, which might not be what we actually want. So. Just to repeat, removing header is just moving pointer. The data does not go away. The header is still there. We can use this, and we do use this. The escape buff, in fact, contains three more pointers called MAC header, NET header, and transport header. And the purpose of those is to point to particles headers. So even when the SK buff, like in this case, the packet is stripped to poor data. There are no, like no, no headers here. We can still access fields in the headers through these pointers very efficiently and very quickly. As I said, there's much more fields in SK buff, but you can look it up in the kernel source code. 
let's return back to what happens uh, in the uh, in the bottom half when we receive when we like found out wh where the data is. So we allocate this, the driver allocates this SK buff for the data. It fills it in, fills it those various fields, which I skipped at the last slide. Most notably protocol. So that's the type of the of the of the data that's like there. So that's in in our case it will be IP. Receiving interface, packet type, and all are different fields. It also sets the MAC header, so it because we now we now know where the uh, where the packet begins, where the MAC header is, so sets the, the 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 pointer to the header, and removes the Ethernet header by moving the pointer. And then it passes the escape buff back up or up to the networking stack. And again, and again, and again, in case we have more packets. We have to repeat that until we, until we uh, read all packets out of the NIC. So this is the situation we are now at. We have the packet that starts here, and we have a pointer to MAC header. Now, the routine or the, the function in the kernel is called, which is responsible for receiving the packet out of the driver. It's called net if receive SKB, SKB if anyone wants to look it up, and it does these things. First thing, that's again kind of optimization, it removes. VLAN tag out of Ethernet header. You may know that Ethernet header can contain VLAN tag. Uh, some NICs strip the VLAN tag on receiving the packet. They don't store it in the data. You wouldn't find it here at all. But instead, they provide it like in, in side channel. So the SK buff has a field for storing a VLAN tag. So if the card is stupid, it's not smart enough, we do this in software. Next thing we do, we set the network header. We can do that because we know that now network header starts at the point where the, the, the packet starts because the header was stripped before. Ah. Next thing, we clone the escape buff and we send it to so-called tabs. What is tab? Tab is a special kind of uh, attachment to the kernel which is able to read any packet received. You know TCP dump or Wireshark? This is what it does. It uses the, it uses the tab. So it taps into the, into the receive part very, very, very early. It's at this point. Next thing which is done, with the original packet, not with the clones, those are gone. Uh, it's we call so-called TC ingress. So maybe some of you knew, know about the, about the TC tool, which is able to do a lot of interesting stuff with traffic. If you don't look it up, it's really interesting. I had a talk actually about TC last year. Uh, so it can like modify packets or even steal them, redirect them elsewhere. So this is at this point, again, very, very early in the pipeline. If the packet is stolen by TC, which can be then processing, obviously, ends. Can be like directed to a different interface. Next thing, we looked whether the VLAN, whether the packet is VLAN tagged. We don't look into the packet, we look into the escape buff because the, the VLAN tag is there now, unconditionally. And if we find VLAN tag, and there is a VLAN interface in the kernel that, be, that has the same value, we just send the packet there and ends processing here. Next, we look whether the interface has a master interface. So if you have a bridge, have interface in a bridge, the bridge is master. So bridge steals the packet and the processing ends. And packet is routed, routed elsewhere to the, to the bridge. So 
No further processing is done for such packet. And next thing, obviously, we look up what is, or we know, we have that stored, the protocol. What is the protocol? What is the, the type of the packet? What, so this, now this is IP, IPv4. So we look into a table of protocols and call appropriate function. So that's IP, R, IP R, RCV in our case. And it again does a lot of things to the packet. So first thing, it drops packets that are not destined, destined to our machine, which we don't care about. We have to do that now and not earlier because, uh, for example, Bridge was interested in all packets received. It pulls the IP header. You see the picture? It's not there. Pull it, move the, move the, the, the blue part, move the uh, data pointer. We verify the IP header checksum, whether it's correct or not. If it's not, we drop the packet, obviously. Next thing, we set, uh, uh, the, we set the transport header pointer. This is the third arrow. We now have all of those three. We start NetFilter. NetFilter, that's IP tables or NF tables. You know that firewall thing uh, has different chains and different tables. If you ever wondered why, this is because different chains in different tables are called in different points during processing. So now we call it pre-routing pre uh, chain. And you can do various stuff there as well. If it is passive, if this is not dropped, we look up the route. So we try to find out what we should do with the packet. Is it for us or should we like forward it to a different, different machine or what? So we look up a route, which will be again, again a st some structure. And, we, and part of the structure is a function that is called on the packet. It's called DST input. And now it really depends on routing table. If the, if, the, if the routing table contains an entry for this packet that it should be forwarded, then the SP input would be, will be IP forward. And if it's local delivery, so the route is going to us, it will be uh, IP local deliver, which again does some processing. So it combines uh, the, the fragmented packets. So you know that IP packets, or you probably should know that IP packets can be fragmented, so need, those fragments need to be collected, and only when all of those are received, the processing can continue. So if it's fragment, it will be stored, and if, if, if it was the last fragment, that it will be reassembled and will continue with the reassembled packet. Next, again, net filter. Remember one thing, now we're in the uh, root handler. So we looked up a root before. So and then now we're in local delivery function. So we consult local in NetFilter chain. In IP forward uh, function, that's the one that would be called if the packet was not to our machine but uh, has to be forwarded to, to a different interface. It will be IP forward function, and that one will call a different NetFilter chains. So, but we call local in. And as the last step, we again look up a table of L4 protocols, find out which one it is from the, from the header, and call appropriate function. This is TCP, and the function is TCP v4 receive, obviously. And again, it starts to be boring because it's still the same. So we remove the header, <laughs> we verify the checksum, sure. Now, interesting part, we now try to find out which application this packet belongs to. As you know, in Linux, if you want to communicate over network, you open a socket, you specify some like, options in socket, like what the destination address is and so on. Uh, 
so and these the sockets that are open by various applications are of course stored in the kernel somewhere and based on the packet fields we find the right socket and if we don't succeed we just so we just send a, a packet to the sender go away no one is here listening for or listening to you so we have a tcp socket next thing we handle so we so called handle tcp or invoke tcp state machine because the socket can be in various states it can be waiting for egg and whatever so this one point like for one sentence is in fact a huge complex topic for the presentation of its own. So I will skip it. We somehow magically handle uh, the TCP state machine. And we found out that, yeah, indeed, we, the, the packet is to be received by the application. And now we enqueue the packet to the socket. Each socket has a queue attached, so called receive queue. And the packets as arrived to that socket are just attached to, to there, to the end. And this is end of the processing. Now, let's, oh, not yet. One more thing. We signal the application that or the that socket, we signal that there is new data available on that socket. This is important if your application is waiting on a poll, is polling the socket, so it's not like busy looping and uh, waiting actively for the packet doing read, 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 read. You can just uh, enter poll, syscall, and it will sleep in the kernel, so this is what will wake your application up. Now let's look at this from the application point of view. So we have application, it calls a read on that socket, goes to the kernel, and kernel does what? It decues the packets from the socket receive queue. It copies the data, possibly from more than one packet, if they fit, to the application provided buffer. So there is a copy there, it has to be. And then it frees resources for the, the SK buff, including the, the, the packet itself. And returns to the application. So now application received our packet, and we're happy. We're there. Now, let's reply. Because obviously, one-way trip would not be useful. So, we'll start with the application and the write syscall. So the application has a buffer and it writes it to the kernel. The kernel just does one thing, it calls a function associated with the socket to send a message. In this case, it would be send message. There are more those calls for different kind of syscalls, but let's stick with the simplest one. This is send message. For TCP, in our case. We have a TCP socket. So the TCP send, send msg function receives the data. It's just raw data. Yeah, it's you, as you saw here, it's just raw data, nothing more. So first thing that we need to do is to allocate escape buff, obviously. We do it in kind of clever way, which I won't go into details, uh, but the result is that we have empty space at the beginning, and probably at the end too, but that's not that important. So we have escape buff. This is, this is um, um, head, this is uh, end, this is tail, and oh, I always mix those up. Uh, and next step, when we have escape buff, it is enqueued to the socket write queue. And then 
the right queue is Im usually immediately processed. Why we do that? It's because we need to have some backlog for recurring and so on. Let's, again, let's not go into details. That would be presentation for many hours if we did. Now, when the TCP write queue is processed, it processes this. First thing, we need to construct the TCP header. So there is source port, destination port, and some check some other stuff, and so on. At this point, we know all of that. We know destination of source port from the socket. Yeah? So we can do that. So we construct a TCP header. And we add it to the SK buff. So we do pull to allocate, or allocate to like create the room, and we copy the header there. And obviously now we know where the transport header starts, so we send a pointer to the transport header. And we go the way back. Remember, on the way in, was called ingress, so on ingress, we went from L2 to L3 to L4 to data. Now we're going the opposite direction, from data to L4, L3, L2, and to the wire, which would be L1. Uh, so this is called egress. Uh, so now we're calling the L3 protocol handler, which would be IPv4. How do we know? From the socket, yes. That's what specif we specified when we opened the socket. So we call the function to, to transmit this packet on L3 level. For IP 4 that would be called IPQ XMIT. And the function does the following things. First, it looks up route, because it needs to know which interface it should use to send the packet out. You can have more, inter more, more networking cards. So this is the root table, which says what's happening. <coughs> As the input to the uh, root lookup function, function, it again uses the data from the socket. Uh, if the, if the uh, route is not found, it returns uh, host unreachable and back to the application as an error code. <coughs> Next thing, it builds IP header. Because at this point, it knows all the stuff that comes into the IP header. Because it has socket and it has the route. Combined, it contains everything. So we built IP header and obviously push, we push it to the SK buff. So it's there. And what will be the next step? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> we set the network header because we know where it is. Again, net filter. Net filter IP tables. We have IP protocol, so we have the firewall. Local out in this case. And then, similarly to how we call the route input action on, on ingress, on ingress we call the route output action, which usually is something really simple like send the packet out, but it can be some really special stuff like encapsulate the packet in a tunnel or drop it because the route, this route goes nowhere. But let's look at the normal, classical, typical situation when we're going out. So we go out via a function called IP output. This function finally sets the escape metadata, like protocol, network interface going out. We know that from the root lookup. Uh, and it was passed to this function as a parameter, uh, and so on. So we set the metadata. We invoke NetFilter post routing because we already did the routing, so it's called post routing the chain. 
we fragment the packet if needed because now we know where it should go to so we know we may know that it is too big for the part MTU that is there again stored in the road uh, so if we need it we fragment the packet into several packets and continue with each separately maybe and then this important thing we still don't know what should be the MAC address. Or the, we know the source MAC address probably because we know the interface, but we don't know the destination MAC address. We don't know where the packet should be sent to on L2 level. So we need to do translation from L3 address to L2 address, which on IP is a ARP protocol. Generically, it's called neighbor, neighbor discovery or neighbor, neighbor lookup. So we need to do neighbor lookup. Uh, <coughs> Then, after the lookup is completed, we'll look into that more later, the L2 header is pushed to the packet, either by using a cached value or by calling neighbor output function. So we have the neighbor, we did the lookup. It either returned the existing entry because the, it was already solved and we know what the MAC address should be, what the neighbor is, or it returns a new neighbor entry which we have to fill in by doing neighbor discovery. So if it's known, that neighbor entry will contain cached header, we just copy there. If it's not known, we have to do ARP, send out ARP, wait for the reply, and then we know. That will be neighbor output function, describe later. And then when we have the packet completed, we call the L2 send function. We can finally send the packet out. So how the network discovery works? Uh, this is the neighbor, uh, neighbor output function, one of those, there are again several of those, resolve output just runs the ARP state machine. If there is no reply, it enqueues the escape buff and waits for the reply. And if there was a reply, it builds the L2 header based on the reply. Oh, okay, I'll have to speed up a bit. Uh, and uh, pushes the header, caches the header for later use. And if we have a queued uh, escape buffs waiting for uh, ARP resolution. When we, res when we receive resolution, we just uh, dequeue them up and continue the processing. The L2 send function, uh, which is called defqxmit, uh, sets the final pointer, calls TC egress. We met that on ingress, so that's like the opposite part. Again, can steal the packet. And then we enqueue the packet to so-called queue discipline, queue disk. This is configurable, so there can be various stuff. The responsibility of that is to hold the queue of packets and send them out to the NIC as needed. So that, uh, okay, I'm missing, I'm missing uh, something here. Uh, so, and uh, the four, is that the QDisk is run, QDisk uh, processing function is being run. It works in this way. It first looks whether the NIC has a free buffers. If it does, it decues the escape buff, uh, does some post-processing on escape buff, uh, which means it tries to emulate in software what the hardware is not capable of. For example, if the hardware cannot use the VLAN tag in metadata and needs it into, in the packet, it just inserts it. It calculates checksums. You maybe noticed that up to this point, we did not deal with checksums at all on the egress path, except the IP header checksum. But the TCP checksum was not there. So it's calculated here. Why? You'll see later. Remember this thing, validate XMIT, validate XMIT SKBs, SKB. Emulates in software what hardware cannot do, just before sending the packet out. And then QDIS calls the NIC driver send function. 
and it repeats it again and again until the queue is not empty or the hardware queue is not full. What does the NIC does, uh, do? First, it ensures that the, uh, uh, make sure that the hardware queue is not full. If it is, it's like it stops, uh, it tells the queue disk, oh, okay, I have this queue full, don't send me more packets. And by the way, requeue this one. This one. I, can, I cannot send it right now. This should not happen because drivers are supposed to stop, stop the queue in time. So when there is last free space that's being to consumed by this escape buff, it will tell the queue disk to stop. It maps the packet data for DMA so the NIC card can read it from the memory. Adds some details from the escape buff metadata, like VLAN tag and so on. And then tells the NIC to send the packet. The NIC then reads the packet out of DMA, calculates the frame check sequence, sends the packet to the wire, and triggers I'm done, interrupt, sent. In response to that interrupt, the driver frees the escape buff because it's not needed anymore, and the, and the corresponding buffer, or uses it in another way. And because it has now free space in the queue, it tells QDisk, OK, you can send me more. So this is how it works on egress. This is slow. If it was implemented that way, you would not have like 10 gigs, uh, we would not have 10 gigs network. So we do some clever things. First, we need to be a bit smarter about checksums. The checksums in IP and TCP are really simple. It's just a sum. It's just a sum of words. So all 16-bit words are summed together. Okay, this, it once complement arithmetic, but whatever. But it's just they just uh, added together. This means that if we are to change some byte somewhere in the packet, all we need to do is to we don't have to recalculate the check sample of the packet. We just add the difference to the checksum that was already calculated, and we're done. This will be important later. So how can we, how, how can we be smart with checksums? First, on ingress, we have something called Rx checksum offloading. The thing is that when Nick is receiving pack the packet, it has to read all the bytes anyway. So there's no point why it should not use that time and using data to calculate the checksum for us. So it does it and gives us the calculated checksum. Like it turns it to the with the packet. Or some NICs compare it, they know the packet structure, so they verify that the, pack, that the, the checksum is really correct or whatever. And uh, uh, it's a bit simple and more difficult than this. And returns us yes, no. Matches fails. Uh, we, we, we like the first, the, 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 the NICs of the first kind more, for again some reasons I won't mention. What we gain that is that is speed up because we don't need to read the data in the kernel by processing the packet. We don't have to calculate the checksum. On egress, we have TX checksum of loading, which is really similar. Instead of calculating the checksum ourselves, we tell the NIC to calculate it for us. So either we tell it from where the checksum, where it should checksum the packet, and where to put it into the packet. Some NICs are able to understand the structure of the packet and do the checksum themselves. We, again, we don't like those cards, but we, we do support them. If the hardware does not support this kind of checksumming, we do it in software, right before handing it over to the card. Remember the validate xmit escape buff function I, I, I told you before? It does this. So it does not calculate checksum if it's not needed. Next thing that we can use to speed things up is to use more queues. Modern hardware is not single queue, it has more queues. So you can imagine there's like multiple NIC cards in one with one wire out. On egress, 
the Q disk has more queues, more queues too, and they are like assigned to hardware queues. And we can stop the queues individually, so each queue can be stopped independently on each other, which allows things like prioritization. Some packets are more, more important than others, so we have a QoS and stuff like that. So this is one of the stuff that it allows us to do. Similarly, on ingress, the packets that are received by the hardware are put into different hardware queues. It's done in a clever way that packets for different, that, that belong to different sockets. How do the NIC now knows? Well, it does not, but uh, it looks into the packet. It has to understand it in this case, and it tries to identify packets that belong to the same stream. So in case of TCP, it has the same IP addresses and destination and source ports. So packets that, are, uh, that belong to the same stream go to the same queue. And packets that belong to different streams would go, in ideal case, to different queues. This allows us to use multiple CPUs to process incoming traffic because we can pin the queues to different CPUs and we can process the queues in parallel. Uh, the same for sending, by the way. And we can go further than this. There is one great thing in the kernel, and that's a really silly name, and the idea behind this thing is that interrupt handling is costly. Whenever the car fire, a cart fires an interrupt, we have to handle it. It takes time. So let's not do that. Especially when they have many, many incoming, like many incoming packets that would lead to interrupt storm. Let's do, so this is called NIPE, and it doesn't do that. It avoids this. So on the first received packet, yeah, the interrupt is fired. But what we do, we stop the interrupts. We tell the car, do not bother, do not send us the interrupts anymore. And instead, we start polling the hardware periodically for incoming traffic. So we schedule a worker, and in the worker calls the driver and eats several packets, like 16 for example. And after a while, it's scheduled again. And again, and again. And if the worker finds that there are no more packets, what do we do? We stop the worker, we stop falling, and we again switch on the interrupt. So on next packet, we repeat this. This is called NAPI. And uh, it runs per queue. So each queue gets its own NAPI. Uh, this leads to interesting thing. Because if you think about how the packets travel through the kernel, then you find out that identical packets are always processed in the same way. Not only that, packets that belong to the same stream are always processed the same way. The fil net filter rules, whatever, they are still they are applied all, all, all the same. So what we do, what we can do is combine them on ingress as early as possible into a super packet. This is called GRO. Generic receive of loading. And the principle behind that is that on NAP, in, in, in NAP receive, the packets coming are combined into one single SK buff. Because we can do that. Because each queue belongs to one stream, to one socket. Well, almost. <laughs> it's hashing, so we still have to check, but yeah. Uh, <coughs> And we keep enough information so we are able to split the packets by, back to individual packets uh, in case we need that later. This saves us time because we don't have to process uh, all that stuff I talk about and all that filter and, also, and so on for each, uh, each of the packets. We do just once for the super packet. When I think about the opposite direction, then application sends data it usually sends more data than fit into a single packet. It's one packet, it's like for one, one and a half kilobytes. Uh, it's quite often sends more. So what we do, again, we, we hold together the data as long as possible and split those into packets at the very end. Again, the same logic, 
we pass the stack only once for multiple packets. This is called GSO, generic segmentation of loading. So again, we built a super packet at the beginning and just go all the way down. So GSO can be viewed as a opposite or complement to GRO. So when application write data, writes data, a GSO packet is created, or when we're forwarding data from interface to interface and we got GRO packets, then they become GSO on output. Nice thing is that if the card, if the NIC hardware can do the splitting of the data for us, we let it do it. We don't do it in the software. So the GSO packet travels all up to the, uh, up to the QDisk as a single super packet, and only if the card doesn't support the, the segmentation, we do it in the software. Where? In validate XMIT cables, of course. We have more stuff than that. This is not the only thing that uh, Linux kernel has to speed processing the packets up. So we have a lot. But we are out of time, so we will not cover that. And we have time to one question for one question. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I didn't get it. Uh, uh, encryption. So encryption, it really depends. I, uh, so the question was, <laughs> the question was, uh, how does encryption fit into the picture? What, where it is done, and what does it? Yeah. Do you know? yeah. Uh, so I omitted that. I omitted a lot of the stuff. So encryption can mean many things. In kernel, we do IPsec or MacSec, for example. Uh, HTTPS is done in the application. Um, nowadays, it can be like accelerated by the kernel, but it's like more, a bit more complex. So traditionally, it's done by application. And the kernel has IPsec and MacSec. It's, of course, plugged into that, that uh, pipeline at points that I did not mention. So there are like more hooks there, more things happening. So at some point the packet is taken and encrypted and, and it goes through different, like different paths. So thank you.